are now on Jude verse 11, which just happens to be the key verse in the book of Jude. Okay? We're going to talk about three things. The way of Cain. Okay? The error of this really strange guy. Balaam, or Bilam, and the rebellion of Korah. That sums up the whole book of Jude and the apostates. Those three things. Okay? Because remember, we had the chiastic structure. Remember that? And in that, we saw the first verse and the last verse of Jude, right? Right. Just ironically, they match. Oh, second verse and second last verse in Jude. And just ironically, they match. And third verse and the third to last. And they match. All the way until you got to a, a center standalone verse, which was verse 11. And that's not just in the book of Jude, that's throughout the Bible. Okay? So we know verse 11, so I decided, well, I just use, if that's really inspired, I'm going to use that for the outline for the study, which I did. So now we are right here. So that is the key verse in this whole section. Okay? So now let's take a look at it. And before we do that, I actually have to do one last quick thing on our last study. Finish up something. I realized I didn't do something. That was 9 and 10 because he talked about in verse 8 reviling angelic majesties. Then in verse 9 he talks about, gives us a strange example of who? Michael, the archangel, not reviling who? Satan, of all the, you would think, well, he's a, you know, of anyone you could revile will be him, right? No. God says no. He has such a, he wants you to honor his structure. You can say the Lord be, rebuke you, which is, you know, if a, um, something appeared in my bedroom at night, I would probably say the Lord rebuke you, <laughs> okay? I wouldn't say I rebuke you. So Michael, the archangel, is that example. Then verse 10, but these men, talking about the apostates, especially the teachers, revile things they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Remember the apostate. Verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. Verse 5, the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, what did that end in? Judgment. The angels who left their proper abode, what did that, in verse 6, what did that end in? Judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, what did that end in? Judgment. So what does this end in? In verse 10, these men, the apostates, judgment. Yeah, all in different ways. Now, this is a little different aspect of it. And the, in the Egyptian, when they left Egypt, okay, that was a sudden destruction. They had all kinds of judgment coming down on them in the wilderness, right? And then the fallen angels, well, they're committed to pits of darkness. So it's not a judgment necessarily here on the earth. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, wish, all wiped out one day. But now he says, by these things they are destroyed, all right? That word for destroyed is corruption. Corruption. They are corrupted. All right? Um, And listen to this. So how does this judgment fall on the apostate and anyone else who falls into this? Well, let's look at Ephesians. Okay. 4.22. All right. It says this, in reference to your former manner of life before you were saved, you lay aside the old self, because you get a new self, right? Take that old self aside, which is being corrupted, same Greek word, okay, in accordance with the lust of the sea, the lust. That's how you get corrupted, and it's deceitful. This is so beautiful. 
It's such a good relationship. But it's okay. That that actually wasn't meant to be funny. But that's the way it works, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It really does. Satan never says, "Hey, I'm Satan here." Yeah, you know, he doesn't have the pitchfork. And, no, he appears as what? An angel of light. Very beautiful. Very deceiving. That's the way his workers work. Okay. Now, also, in Revelation 19.2, okay, same Greek word, Revelation 19.2 says this. It says, for he has judged the great harlot, that's from chapters Revelation 17 and 18. Now, in 19, he says this, who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. Ooh, first it was lust, now in immorality, you see the path Satan's going? He's attracting us by the flesh. It's deceitful. And you get corrupted. The judgment of the apostates, okay, by immorality. All right? Very simple thing. Very simple thing. Okay. And then last one is 1 Corinthians 3.17. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says this. If any man destroys, get that, get this. That word destroy is the same thing. The same Greek word. Okay, if any man destroys or corrupts the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that's what you are. So if anyone comes against Christians and tries to destroy them by this corruption, God's going to destroy them with corruption. So now we're going to go into the ancient trio of apostates. The middle verse, all right? The middle verse. Woe to them, talking about the apostate, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Three different things. So this, we'll kind of take apart those three different things and see what they mean, all right? When it says woe to them, the Greek word is an interjection of grief or indignation. Okay, it's making a mournful cry. It's a warning. Okay, and this is God talking to them. Woe to you. Okay, one translation is it will be terrible for them. Another translation is what sorrows await them. All right, so the way of Cain. Woe to them for they have gone the way of Cain. Now we're going to find out exactly what the way of Cain is. Okay. Let's look at the way of Cain right here. What is the way of Cain? Now, my first question is, trick question. I'll warn everybody up front. This is a trick question. What is worship? What is worship? Think about that for a second. What is worship? Now, we have our 21st century Western answer. That's where you sing some songs before you get into the teachings, right? I mean, seriously, that's, that's what we think of it. I even call it that. Yeah. Okay. But what is worship? What is it really? Worship in the, the breakdown of the word itself is anything you give worth to in any way. Right? Get it? Worth ship? Worship. That's where we get that word from. Okay. So it's what you do to attribute worth to anything, okay? Now, it could be it's in everything. So when you sing songs to God, is that worship? Yes. Okay. How about having your quiet time? Is that worship? Yeah. Okay. How about um, having real, now, listen carefully, having real fellowship with another Christian, is that worship? Okay, so if I get together, say me and Nate, and we talk about the Super Bowl, or you know how his team is doing versus how my team is doing, is that worship? No, koinonia, right? It means a commonness, koine. It's a commonness, okay? Like the koine Greek is what the New Testament's written in. It's the common Greek, the street language, okay? Of you know that everybody use. So in the same way. 
koinonia is where you come together and have a commonness. But it's not just any. It's not based upon a football team or it's not based upon, you know, what's happening at the mall or your favorite store. It's a commonness based upon what? Sharing the things of, of the Lord. Okay. So in that way, that could be worship. Now, as we go through this, what I want to do is just quickly read the incident. So if you go to Genesis 4, 2, I'll start at verse 1. Now the man had relationships with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. All right? Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the land. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought his firstlings of the flock in their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and this desire is for you, but you must master it. Okay, so they apparently, the Bible doesn't purport to tell every little detail, but apparently they had some kind of worship system, right? How did they know to do that? So God was giving them revelation. Now, usually we put it this way. The reason why Cain was rejected was because why? I mean, the American is an answer. They said, well, his was a bloodless sacrifice. False. Cain's was. False worship. Okay, yes, it was false worship, but why? So we say it was a bloodless sacrifice, all right? But are there fruit offerings in the Bible? Yeah, and they're acceptable, right? So I don't think it was that. Let's go to Hebrews 11.4. And they're going to tell us why Abel's was pleasing to God and why Cain's was not. It says this, Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So how did Abel offer a better sacrifice? By faith. Because Hebrews 11.6, a couple of verses later, says this, And without faith it is impossible to please him. Okay? For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who seeks him. So it is kind of what you said, Pam, and that it is a heart issue. Okay? And so it was by faith. So it wasn't the kind of offering necessarily, I don't think. It was because of faith. Now, also, Cain's deeds. Remember we talked about worship just being everything, right? Being your whole life. Listen to this in 1 John chapter 3, 11 and 12. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So it's basically saying that Cain was an evil person. So if you bring your offering before God and you are basically not living the correct life, is it? does God accept that? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. We need clean hands and a pure heart. And I'm not talking about, it. I'll bring in an Americanism now. Well, nobody's perfect. Okay, there, I did it so we don't have to, we don't have to go through that. Okay. Um, gosh, stuff like that makes me so mad. And I'm not saying we're saved by works or anything like that. I am just saying it does matter how you live. 
It does matter how you worship. Everything. And here it's just um, come just as you are. Right? That's a song. But anyways, but God doesn't keep you just as you are. Okay? <laughs> you will be changed. Right? And isn't that the user-friendly slogan? Come just as you are. Mm -hmm. And all this other stuff. Now, I'm not saying wear a suit and tie. I obviously don't. This is me in my best shorts right here. My Sunday best. Lisa kind of grimaced there. But anyways, <laughs> this is me in my Sunday best. <laughs> Didn't mean to. <laughs> okay. But this is me in my Sunday best. Okay. But seriously, it does matter how you live. It does matter how you offer that stuff. So the way of Cain is false worship. Why? It's faithless and his deeds were evil. So he's living the wrong kind of life, right? So God does not accept that. So no faith, wrong lifestyle, and you end up with false worship, okay? So the way it came is false worship, seeking one one's own way in the place of God's way. All right, so you're now developing your own thing. Because remember that little thing I talked about where you downplay. This is some, something that God kind of showed me, and then all of a sudden I started fitting it to everything in here, and it's like, wow, that works. You downplay what? Three things in a certain order. First, you downplay, yes, the Word of God, good. Then you could downplay obedience, right? Well, it doesn't really matter, and I don't have to cross my eyes and say, you know, nobody's perfect, right? Okay, good. And then you downplay, lastly, what? Lifestyle. If you really are living by faith, you're totally given over to God 24-7, and you're not doing that kind of stuff. You see what I'm saying? I know that. It, it really is true. In other words, the second you guys wake up until you fall asleep, I want you guys focused in on God. Okay? When you get up, I want the first words out of your mouth to be praising God. Was that the Ezekiel 38 war that we just saw? No. Okay. What people are pointing to is Psalms 83. The reason why they point to Psalms 83 is because in the Ezekiel 38 war, when you trace all the allies that come down on Israel, none of them are the Islamic nations around Israel, which doesn't make any sense unless they've been eliminated earlier. And so that's why people say, yeah, Bill Solis, I think is the name of the guy, wrote a book on it. And I've been following him the last few months. That's because perhaps they are destroyed in this conflict here. Then there's no Islamic nations against them. Then they are the unwalled villages dwelling in peace and safety when Gog comes down. And who is Gog? No, no, Gog. Gog is the leader. Magog, which means land of Gog. Okay. And then who is Gog? He is a demon king. In the Septuagint. In the Septuagint version. Talked about Gog. Okay. And, he, and that's why he appears a thousand years later at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. Okay. And that's why people make the mistake of putting that the invasion of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, which is ridiculous. So how will we know in Ezekiel 38 and 39 Ezekiel 39? Yeah, and there's some people who have come up with new theories, which they may be right, that Gog, or excuse me, yeah, that Magog is like some Islamic country like Turkey or something. I forget with, with the theory. But we know, number one, it's got to be led by a nation that's north of Israel, Okay, well, where's Russia? 
Turks north. So is Turkey. Mm -hmm. So is Turkey. And then also, according to Chuck Missler in the ancient records, that that they put that China built the Great Wall to keep out the Scythians, which is modern day Russia. They they in fact it says they built the wall to keep out Magog which is Russia. So you can take it for whatever. I think it, I personally think it's Russia. And I think everything is being positioned for that invasion right now, which when that happens, that sets things up nicely. Oh, and there's a guy, I'll finish with this. There was a guy, he comes up with a lot of prophecy stuff. He said, he was showing this thing about this guy who had this dream about the tribulation. He saw a lot of things. Yeah. And, he, and he said, I saw the Antichrist. I'm not going to tell you who he is. Well, there's a leader of this nation that just had this news interview that Steve Chocolate showed. And he goes, I called that guy who had that dream. And I said, did you see this guy? He goes, that's the guy I saw. And it turns out he's the head of a nation. And when I thought about it, this guy would be the perfect guy who could pull off everything that it says that the Antichrist pulls off. Like Saudi Arabia. Huh? Yes, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. If he's, yes, he won't be revealed as the Antichrist. In other words, he'll be known. But if you think about it, he's probably the number one Muslim in the world. And he can build the wall in Ezekiel that separates the holy from the profane. In other words, he can do that. And he can, and plus, in the Ezekiel invasion, it talks about how Saudi Arabia is on the sideline, basically watching it, but not participating in it. And who was making a deal with Saudi Arabia before all this happened? Israel. I'm thinking, this is one possible scenario, they were dealing with that stuff, but it was too early. Then this happens. Then the Psalms 83 war, because it's not the timing for that yet. And so... I'm just saying for right now, he's a very likely candidate. So don't be misled by he is not going to be, we're not going to know who he is. It's not like he's some obscure person that just appears on the scene. Okay. But he, it means that he will not be revealed. Our apocalypsis, I think it is, our um, apocalypsis, which is like the same thing as the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apocalypsis or unveiling of Jesus Christ. In other words, we know who Jesus is, but it's new information on him in the book of Revelation. Get it? So I'm just saying that the Antichrist will be revealed as of the Antichrist. It, it talks about he will not, it, something, there's a passage in Daniel that talks about the God of his fathers, which is a very Jewish thing. So the indication is that he's Jewish, or at least partly Jewish, and at the same time, he could have all kinds of other ties, like Muslim ties, and other things. So I just think that he's going to be something where both sides will accept him as that. Okay. Now, is this crown prince of Saudi Arabia anyway? I don't know. If he is, he's, he probably wouldn't reveal it right now, but he might reveal it later. So there's all kinds of factors involved with this. Okay. If it is the Ezekiel thing that's next, if it is, which could happen before the rapture, okay, then you're not going to see something. This would be a, a, a mild thing compared to what Ezekiel is. When you read all the allies of Gog and Magog, okay, and them coming down, it's going to be a big coalition that comes down. In other words, everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, this is it. This is world war right here, okay? And then that's when God smokes them. Side, Jerusalem Post wrote a story about a year and a half ago that the headline is Saudi royal family are descendants of Whoa. So, now get this. Now get this. He's the crown prince, which means officially he's not the king. His father's the king, but he's in his 80s, kind of see you now. So he's really running it. And you talk about somebody that could give perfect answers yes. to appease everybody, yes. which is he 
you know, that's a, the exact description of the Antichrist. Yeah. He's not going to do it by force, take over the world. Remember the first horseman, the white horse that comes out, I think Revelation 6, okay? That's the Antichrist. He, he comes conquering. He's got a, he's got a bow, right? But no arrows, I think. In other words, he doesn't do it by military force, but he had kept coming with answers like, well, you guys are supporting China. Isn't that hurting the United States? Well, this is just only business. We want everybody to prosper. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He'll come up with the perfect answer yeah. every time he's given the diplomatic answers. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Perfect guy to be where he is. Just like an angel of light. In other words, he's everybody's friend. He, he, even his whole appearance and demeanor. Yeah. You instantly buddy up yeah. to him, don't you? It's like, yeah. oh gosh, I really like this guy. Seriously. 